corpus delecti, Latin for body of the crime, is, in Western law, basically the principle that a crime must be proved to have occurred before a person can be convicted of committing that crime. When a person disappears, most police forces initiate a missing person case. If, during the course of the investigation, they believe the missing person to have been murdered, then a list of evidence, physical, demonstrative and testimonial, must be obtained to establish that the missing person has indeed died, and that their death was by homicide. Then a suspect can be charged with murder. The clearest evidence in these cases is obviously the physical body of the deceased. However, in the event of the body not yet being discovered, it is possible to prove a crime took place if sufficient circumstantial evidence is presented to prove the matter beyond a reasonable doubt. For centuries there was a belief in England that without a body there could be no trial for murder. This misconception is thought to have stemmed from what became known as the Camden Wonder Case of 1660, when a Gloucestershire man vanished and his servant, plus the servant's mother and brother, were in due course hanged for his murder. Two years later, the supposed victim turned up alive and well in the village, claiming to have been abducted, bundled onto a ship and taken overseas. Following this, there seemed to be a reluctance to convict on a charge of murder in the absence of a body. In 1919, a woman called Mamie Stewart disappeared in South Wales. Despite a large amount of circumstantial evidence, her husband George was not charged with murder as her body could not be found. Instead, he served a short prison sentence for bigamy and died in 1958. The body was finally discovered in 1961 and a coroner's court found him posthumously guilty of murder. Before the advent of DNA, the discovery of a dismembered body often made this assumption both questionable and difficult. In episode 41 of Tales from the Hangman's Record, we looked at the case of Dr Crippen, who was hanged in 1910 for the murder of his wife, Cora. Parts of the body were found in Crippen's cellar and identified from a scar on the stomach. With the body wrapped in a pyjama jacket that was produced four years after Crippen had moved in, this ultimately led detectives to believe he was guilty as charged. Various theories in more recent times have suggested the body was in fact that of a man. In English law, the no body, no murder principle was finally abolished in 1954, and as such, a murder conviction can now be obtained on circumstantial evidence alone, should this be sufficiently compelling and convincing. Today's story was a landmark case in the 20th century, being perhaps the most high profile a widely reported case in the No Body, No Murder timeline. The school bell rang at 3.30 on the afternoon of Tuesday the 5th of January 1937. It was a second day back in school after the Christmas holidays and after the bell had sounded, the children hurried out of Guildhall Street Methodist School, Newark on Trent, in the English East Midlands, and made their way home. Amongst them was ten-year-old Mona Lillian Tinsley, who lived a twenty-minute walk away at 11 Thorsby Avenue. When Mona hadn't returned home by five o'clock, her father Wilfred set out in the winter darkness, calling her to her friend's houses in the hope she had stopped off on the way home from school. This drew a blank, and later that evening, along with his wife Lillian, they called at the local police station and reported their daughter missing. A sergeant told them if she still hadn't returned, they would launch a manhunt at daybreak. With Mona failing to return home, an intense search was mounted. Under the command of Chief Constable Harry Burns, officers made door-to-door -door inquiries, rivers and canals were dragged, fields and empty properties searched, with the police assisted by hundreds of local volunteers. The inquiries soon brought in several good leads. Two witnesses came forward to say they had seen the girl at the bus station in the company of a middle-aged man. One young boy said she was with an older man with stirring eyes, and another was able to identify the man 
as a former lodger of the Tinsleys. A neighbour also informed the police that she had seen this former lodger loitering alone on the street corner close to Mona's school at about three o'clock. Investigations also led to bus conductor Charles Revel, who told police that on the previous day, a young girl matching Mona's description had boarded his 4.45 bus from Newark to Retford in the company of a middle-aged man. He had purchased a return ticket for himself, but only a single half ticket for the girl. They had alighted at Grove Street next to Retford Market. And with this new information, Mona's parents were spoken to and said that the former lodger was Frederick Hudson. Hudson had briefly lodged with the Tinsleys until October 1935, after being introduced to them by Lillian's sister, Edith Grimes. They had reluctantly evicted him when he became unable to pay his rent, but stressed his departure had been on amicable terms, adding that in the short time Hudson had lodged with them, he had been popular with their seven children, who all called him Uncle Fred. Edith Grimes was interviewed and told the police that the man her sister knew as Hudson was actually 49-year-old Frederick Nodder, and that he had adopted the surname Hudson, changing this and moving to Redford after becoming a subject of a defiliation order in Sheffield. She described Nodder as a brutish and squally drunk, with poor personal hygiene and few friends. He worked as a motor mechanic and lorry driver in Redford, but due to his drinking, was often out of work. Grimes told her that Nodder had deserted his wife many years before he had lodged with her. Having previously been in a relationship with Nodder, she said she was unaware of his current address and claimed that she had not seen him for several months, although this was contradicted by a neighbour who recalled Nodder's work van perched outside their home around Christmas time 1936. Inquiries soon led officers to a Retford Hallage company where Nodder had recently been employed. The firm told police that his address was a cottage called Peacehaven on Smeath Road at Hayton Smeath near Retford. Superintendent John Burkett questioned Frederick Nodder late on Wednesday evening the 6th of January. Officers staked out his rented home and as he approached shortly before 11 o'clock, he was challenged. Producing a photograph of Mona and asked if he knew the child, Nodder confirmed that he used to know her but he had not seen her or her family for over a year since he had been evicted from the Tinsley's house for non-payment of rent. Questioned about his movements on the previous day, Nodder admitted he had been in Newark, but claimed he had been there looking for work. He also claimed to have returned to Retford alone on the 3.45 bus. This timing was crucial, as it was approximately 10 minutes before Mona is believed to have been abducted. Interviewing his neighbours, one told detectives she had seen a young girl matching Mona's description at Nodder's house on Wednesday lunchtime. Wearing a blue dress, the young dark-haired girl had been standing in the back doorway of the house, watching Nodder digging in his garden. The eyewitness testimonies were enough to detain Nodder as a result of the affiliation order. Having been seen digging in the garden, both inside and outside of the house were extensively searched. Detectives also searched nearby empty properties, drains, ditches, wells and cesspits within a three-mile radius, of Nodder's property, and a five-mile stretch of the Chesterfield Canal, a short walk from Nodder's house, was also drained. Although the search of the grounds of Peacehaven proved fruitless, despite digging the entire garden to a depth of several feet, inside the house there was a number of vital clues. A handkerchief later found to belong to Mona was discovered near a water tank at the back of the house, along with scraps of paper depicting a child's drawing and writing. A fingerprint taken from crockery in the kitchen was that of a child, and matched those taken from items Mona was known to have handled at her home. An ominous and more sinister discovery was made in the main bedroom. Beneath a pillow, officers found an open packet of sweets, two soiled handkerchiefs and a tin of Vaseline. To the experienced detectives, this finding indicated a likely sexual motive for the child's abduction, and therefore it was likely the child had since been killed to prevent her testifying. On the following morning, Nodder was placed in identity parade. Every witness who had seen Mona Tinsley since she left school that Tuesday picked Nodder out as the man they had seen in her company. Confronted with both these positive identifications and evidence discovered at his home, Nodder now changed his story. He now claimed to have encountered Mona by chance outside her school. 
It was she who recognised him first, calling out, Hello, Uncle Fred. They chatted for a few minutes before Mona asked him to take her to Sheffield to visit her auntie Edith to see her newborn cousin Peter, who she had yet to meet. He said he had agreed to the request as he expected to see Mrs Grimes on the following day. Nodder and Edith Grimes were still involved in a relationship and she would usually visit him at Peacehaven on Saturdays and Wednesdays. He had therefore reluctantly allowed Mona to spend the evening at his home, intending to take her to Sheffield on the following morning. Nodder then said he had changed his mind as he was worried about the bastardy order against him and fearful of arrest, he gave Mona two shillings and saw her on the bus to Sheffield the following evening with both written and verbal instructions how to reach her aunt's home and a note explaining the reason for her visit. Wanted posters were printed up and extensive searches in and around Newark, Sheffield and Hayton failed to find any trace of Mona Tinsley and Nodder, although I suspect of something far more serious, was at this stage just charged with the abduction of Mona Tinsley. I did not take her away by force, he protested, before being taken into custody. Although Nodder maintained he had last seen the child when he saw her onto the bus, detectives were certain they were dealing with the murder investigation. After three weeks of relentless legwork and searches, the Chief Constable of Newark, Harry Burns, reluctantly decided to seek the help of Scotland Yard. On Monday the 25th of January, Chief Inspector Leonard Burt and Detective Sergeant Jim Scarden left London and headed for Hayton, having been warned by the Nottinghamshire Police that they now believe Mona's body may have been thrown in the River Idle and possibly swept out to sea. They immediately organised another extensive search of every house, drain, ditch and pond within three miles of Peacehaven. This search was at the time one of the most extensive in British police history, although it would ultimately again prove fruitless. On Tuesday the 9th of March, Frederick Nodder appeared before Mr Justice Swift at Birmingham Assizes. He was charged with taking Mona Tinsley by fraud with the intent of depriving her father of possession of her, of detaining her by fraud, of decoying and enticing her into his possession, and of unlawfully stealing and carrying away the child and secreting her against the wishes of her father. Norman Burkitt KC led for the prosecution. Despite what the detectives surmised, he could only argue that Nodder had abducted the child. Nodder opted not to testify, leaving his defence counsel to reiterate his claims that Mona Tinsley had spent one night at his home before he had given her the fur and instructions how to travel to her aunt's at Sheffield. He insisted that he had not seen her since. His counsel argued that there was no proof any harm had befallen Mona and that no one should speculate to her actual fate. Despite this, the jury took just 16 minutes to convict Nodder of the abduction of Mona Tinsley. Summing up, Mr Justice Swift referred to Nodder's refusal to testify, stating, Nobody knows what has become of that little girl. Whatever happened to her, how she furred, or who looked after her, or where she slept. There is one person in this court who knows he is silent. He says nothing at all to you. He sits there and never tells you a word. It may be that time will reveal the dreadful secret you carry in your breast. I cannot tell, but I am determined that, as far as I have a part in that dreadful tragedy of the 5th and 6th of January, I will keep you in custody. He then sentenced Nodder to seven years imprisonment. With Nodder safely ensconced in Lincoln Prison, the investigation remained active, but as extensive searches had been made throughout the area, it was scaled back in the hope that time would reveal the missing girl. And so it was to be. On Sunday the 6th of June 1937, brewery manager Victor Marshall and his family were boating on the River Idle in Bawtry when they spotted an object floating in the water close to the bank. Steering the boat closer, they discovered the partially decomposed body of a child, with its head and upper torso embedded in silt and trapped in a drain below water level. They had found Mona Tinsley. The body was approximately a dozen miles downstream from where Nodder lived, and had been weighed down with wood and metal 
with only a lower trunk floating above the surface of the water. Close by the riverbank was a torn and rotting sack, which had evidently been used to transport the child's body. Mona's body was carefully removed from the water and taken to the nearby ship inn at Newington, where, from the fragments of clothing present, her distraught father was able to confirm it was his daughter. The body was then taken by ambulance to Retford Mortuary to await a post-mortem. Pathologists Henry Holden and James Webster were able to confirm Mona had been strangled, most likely with a ligature, and that she had been dead before entering the water. But, due to the level of decomposition, it was not possible to tell if she had been sexually assaulted, although deep bite marks resulting from strangulation were still evident on her tongue. On the following day, an underwater search unit located a child's coat and a Wellington boot. On Thursday the 10th of June 1937, the funeral of Mona Tinsley took place at her local Methodist church where Mona had attended Sunday school. Several hundred people, including many of Mona's school friends, lined the streets as her coffin was led from the Methodist church to Newark Cemetery where her body was interred. So far, news of the discovery of the body had been kept from Nodder. But on Monday the 28th of June, he was formally charged by Superintendent Burkitt of having committed the murder with malice aforethought of Mona Lillian Tinsley. Five months after the body was discovered, Nodder appeared at Nottingham Assizes held at the Shire Hall, this time on a murder charge. The second trial began on Monday the 22nd of November 1937. Mr Justice McNaughton presided and as before Norman Burkitt appeared on behalf of the prosecution with Maurice Healy reprising his role as a defence counsel. As at the previous trial, Healy again argued his client denied killing the child, repeating the assumption that Mona had been abducted by another individual while travelling alone to Sheffield and that it was that man that had committed the murder. The prosecution called many witnesses to testify they had seen Nodder in the company of the young girl and also testifying again was pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsby who told the court that Mona had been strangled from behind with a ligature such as a bootlace or a cord which had been drawn behind her head and then tightened. Spilsby also testified that the deep bite marks still evident on Mona's tongue at the time of discovery indicated the child had bitten her tongue for an extended period of time as the act of strangulation had occurred. The trial lasted just two days, with the jury taking barely an hour and a quarter to find Frederick Nodder guilty of murder. Unsurprisingly, there was no recommendation to mercy. Asked if he had anything to say after hearing the jury's verdict, Nodder stood before the judge before declaring in a low but firm tone, I shall go out of this court with a clear conscience. In passing the death sentence, Mr Justice McNaughton told the prisoner, Justice has slowly but surely overtaken you. It only remains for me to pronounce a sentence which the law and justice require. Nodder was returned to Lincoln Jail, but this time to the condemned cell. He launched an appeal against his sentence, contending that the evidence presented against him at the trial was purely circumstantial and not conclusive of his guilt. His appeal was heard on Monday the 13th of December before the Lord Chief Justice Hewitt and Judges Branton and Porter. It was his second appearance in the Court of Appeal, and like the one back in April, it was quickly dismissed on the same day. A crowd of over 200 assembled outside the prison gate to wait for the fateful hour, and at 9 o'clock on a cold, frosty Thursday morning, the 30th of December 1937, Frederick Nodder was led to the gallows at Lincoln Prison by Tom Pierpoint and his assistant Stanley Cross. Unmourned and shunned by his family, child murderer Frederick Nodder became just another entry in Hangman Tom Pierpont's diary, his ninth execution that year. What is interesting about this case is the use of a spiritualist medium in trying to help find the missing child. Several offered their services to police, including the renowned Estelle Roberts. Just days after the disappearance of Mona Tilsley, Miss Roberts contacted the Chief Constable Harry Burns, 
offering her assistance in locating the child on condition her involvement was kept out of the papers and remained confidential. She asked Burns to mail her some clothing the child had worn and later wrote, As I took the silk dress from its wrapping and held the soft material in my hands, I knew at once that Mona was dead. Mona spoke to me, saying she had been taken to a small house where she had been strangled. She gave me a picture of a house with a water-filled ditch on one side, a field at the back, a church close by and an inn within sight. In my vision I was taken to a graveyard over a bridge and across some fields to a river beyond. There I stopped, unable to go further. She also said Mona had spent much of her time within this house copying something out of a book. This was very significant in establishing credibility as detectives hadn't made public or informed Roberts of the scraps of children's drawing or writings discovered in Nodder's house. She also stated that the child had been strangled in an upstairs bedroom before her killer placed her body in a sack and transported her remains to a river beyond the field which existed behind the house, concluding, you will find the child's body there. And they did. Thank you for watching and listening to this episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Your support really is important to help keep the channel growing. Check out my website, stevefielding.com, for information on all my books and for links to all the other videos in this series. The website shop also sells copies of the Hangman's Record 3-volume series plus assorted copies of my other older titles. It also stocks copies of volumes 1 and 2 of Tales from the Hangman's Record. These are both still available as a paperback and Kindle download. I'll look out for Volume 3 due very soon. Also, take a look at my new podcast channel, Mostly Murder, which features a variety of true crime cases and is available on Spotify and all the usual platforms. Do you agree justice was done in this case and that Nodder deserved to be hanged? Use the comments below for your thoughts on this case and for suggestions for further episodes. So, until the next time, thank you and goodbye.